Right, uh, welcome to, the, to lecture six, and more importantly, welcome to the Anthropocene. Um, some people say Anthropocene, other people say Anthropocene, doesn't really matter, it's the same object of attention, okay? Um, so in the literature and art section of this course, what we're looking at is ways of seeing. So we have data, what do we do with that data? What, what different perspectives can we bring to that data that allow us to feel it more urgently and to see it anew? Uh, and so what we're talking about today is uh, a new way of seeing the Anthropocene as a kind of paradigm shift that has all sorts of implications for how we perceive the relationship between humans and the planet. But I want to start with another example of a kind of paradigmatic shift in perspective. And this is the um, 1968 Apollo 8 uh, uh, encounter with what came to be known as the Blue Planet. Two days before Christmas in 1968, astronauts Borman, Lovell, and Anders became the first humans to pass out of Earth's gravitational control and into that of another body in the solar system, the moon. Everything in a NASA mission is completely planned out, you know, right down to where you pee and what you eat. And here was this moment, no one had anticipated the emotional power of the Earth rise. Oh my God, look at that picture over there. There's the Earth coming up. Wow, that's pretty. Hey, don't take that my schedule. <laughs> you got a color film, Jim? Hand me a roll of color quick. Oh, man, that's cool. Where is it? Quick. And they were scurrying for the camera. Like, where's their film? You know, who got it? And there was even a debate about who took the picture because it was so hurried. Take the film. Let's go. Here, here. Wait a minute. Let me just get the right thing here. Calm down. Calm down. Okay, so I want you to think a little bit about this, this image and why it had such a profound impact, this, this unprecedented perspective on Earth. Um, and I think we can think about it symbolically and historically. And I just wanted you briefly to um, get into groups of three. You don't have to move. If you're too far from somebody, make it a group of two. And just discuss why this image might have had such a powerful emotional and social impact on people at the time. Um, and then in five minutes or so, we'll, one of you can report back and we can pool our, our sense of, of, of why exactly um, this, this particular unexpected image um, had such a global resonance. So hopefully you're all within shouting distance of each other. Or without shouting, yeah.
Okay. Um, let's get some feedback. Um, anybody want to volunteer? Some spokesperson for your group? Yes, yeah, so this is a, a unique perspective on Earth. Uh, it, it, Earth from a distance, but paradoxically, it also felt for many people more intimate because it's the first time that you could see Earth as small, uh, in a sense, and whole. And that's where the whole Earth movement, Whole Foods, all of those things started um, with the idea of finally, for the first time in, in human history, being able to see this object uh, in its in its entirety. So good. Any any other thoughts about? Yeah. Right. Okay. Really. This also a really good point. Um, so that black backdrop, the vast expanse of the universe. Um, made Earth seem fragile in some ways. And, and, you know, how does that make us as humans feel um, in terms of that uh, vast spatial expanse? Um, and so that connects with something that we're going to be talking about today, which is the vast geological expanses that the Anthropocene paradigm invites us to think across. So part of what we're looking at in the arts and literature section of this course is the challenges of scale. How do we feel our way into this kind of scale, um, uh, both spatially and in terms of time? Other thoughts that people had? Yeah. Right, that's a good word, existential. So it definitely raised a lot of existential questions for people. Um, and and the, somehow the blueness also, there's, a, there's an aesthetic element to it there. You know, uh, it, there, there's a great beauty to that, that image of a, of a kind of a blue marble in this, in this black backdrop. Uh, apart from Robbie, are there any historians here? What was going on in 1968? I know none of you were around then, but yeah. Sorry? The Cold War, very much the Cold War. What other war? Yeah, okay, the Vietnam War, or what the Vietnamese call the American War. Um, so that was a big, uh, it, it, was, this was, it was one of the most, um, in terms of conflicts and massacres, and it was a very, very, uh, um, it was sort of at the peak of the Vietnam War. And in American politics, Sorry? Civil Rights Act was passed in 1968, and George Wallace did surprisingly well, I think most people depressingly well, as a segregationist independent candidate in the, 19, in the uh, elections. Okay, any, we're getting there. Any, any other thoughts about 1968 in American history? Yep, the space race, part of the Cold War, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, counterculture. Uh, the anti-war movement was huge. Um, hey Jude was the number one best-selling song that year. Um, and it was the year that uh, Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy were assassinated, okay? Uh, and those assassinations, uh, especially Martin Luther King, catalyzed um, huge protests, social unrest, uh, violence and between the police and protesters at uh, the Democratic Convention in Chicago. Um, uh, and so it was a very, very volatile year. And uh, if anything, sort of even more 
polarized than, than the Trump years in, in, in the US. Uh, and so right at the end of that year, 1968, there was this mission to um, circumnavigate the, the moon and the surprising image materialized, just this moment of serendipity. And so a lot of people latched onto that in these divisive times as an image of the need for unity uh, and the need to um, see Earth as a community uh, rather than a sense of conflict. And so it was a big, big catalyzing movement, um, a moment for um, the environmental movement as part of a broader set of countercultural movements, including the women's movement, uh, civil rights movement, uh, and the movement to end the Vietnam War. Okay. So I want to go move from that moment to the to the to the coinage of the term Anthropocene. And so basically, at, at root, this is what it means. What would it mean to imagine Homo sapiens as not just a historical actor, but a geological actor, a force of such magnitude that our impacts are being written into the fossil record? Okay. So a couple of things here. Um, Normally, historians and geologists occupy different spaces. And one of the things that the Anthropocene does as a paradigm is it brings into conversation a lot of different disciplines, a lot of different fields. Um, and the argument of those who coined the term was that for the first time in planetary history, 4.5 billion years, we have a um, sentient species, namely Homo sapiens, that has had such varied and consequential and deep time impacts on the life systems that sustain the planet, uh, that sustain life on planet. Uh, for the first time, the sentient species has had such an impact that it has catapulted the geological record of the planet into a whole new epoch called the Anthropocene. Um, so not since the cyanobacteria, maybe 2.5 billion years ago, has a living, uh, ha have living organisms impacted uh, the life, Earth life systems uh, in, in such a dramatic fashion. And the second point I wanted to make about this is that there, these, these impacts are being written into the fossil record. Okay, so... Thinking about the Anthropocene demands a certain kind of reading, just as we can read climate change of ice core samples or of tree rings. We can read our impacts uh, through the fossil record, uh, the, the, what, what one might call future remains. Okay? So what will the future remains be of our civilizational moment? Okay? So the from the beginning, it was an interdisciplinary paradigm. Uh, Paul Critzen, uh, who's an atmospheric chemist, and uh, Eugene Sturmer, an eminent ecologist, coined the term. So they argued that the scale and variety of human impacts on Earth's biogeochemistry have become so significant that human actions have catapulted the planet into a whole new post-Holocene epoch. So the relatively stable Holocene epoch in, uh, in which human civilizations evolved uh, has been terminated and we're in a new, less stable phase. That was their argument. Um, so many of you will have seen something similar to this. Uh, if we think of Earth's planetary history as a 12-hour period, um, humanity arrives in the last two seconds, okay, the way you arrive in uh, Nexus 200. Um, and uh, the Anthropocene uh, arrives like one tenth of a second ago. Okay? So it's a, a, an infinitesimal um, but hugely consequential dimension to uh, planetary history. So the, the Berkeley uh, biologist, Anthony Bonofsky, uh, tried to encapsulate this uh, idea in an image when he says, we are the asteroid, okay? Uh, that Homo sapiens en masse 
uh, is, is, is on like a collision cycle in some ways with the Earth. Um, and so part of what the Anthropocene uh, paradigm invites us to do is to think of humanity as a, a hurtling chunk of rock that feels, a sentient rock in a certain way, um, that jolts the Earth and disturbs and reorients uh, all the major life systems. So what are, what are these impacts? Um, since the Trinity test in the 1940s, um, uh, humans have, or some humans, have unleashed unprecedented isotopes. And um, if all goes to plan, those isotopes will be legible in the record, in some cases, billions of years now, from now, um, when presumably there won't be um, um, geologists to around to, to trace them. Um, but it requires us to leap into these vast tracts of time and think back about what legacy we're leaving in the biogeochemistry of the Earth. So in the, the cryosphere, the, the frozen sections of the Earth, we, we've ha ha had a huge accelerated impact, which in turn uh, um, is, is linked to uh, warming and rising oceans. This is the Three Gorges Dam. We've uh, reorganized the hydrosphere, the planetary hydrosphere, the atmosphere. This is a pre-COVID shot. Uh, and the, uh, with, with industrialized uh, scale farming, uh, we, we have ha uh, habit, habitat clearance uh, with the impact on, uh, particularly with deforestation, on uh, the rate of extinction. Okay. So all of these, um, all of these have a um, have a massive consequence uh, for the character and the possibilities of life on Earth. I'm not going to get into the next point in any great detail, but I just wanted to flag the fact that there have been a lot of debates as to when the Anthropocene begins. Um, for some, uh, what the, those proponents of what's called the the Long Anthropocene. Um, it begins with the agricultural revolution. Okay? And so they're arguing that um, in the geological record, you will be able to trace the beginnings of uh, the, the agricultural revolution. Others have argued that, at least in the Americas, uh, the Colombian invasion uh, was hugely significant and, again, will be discernible in the geological record. Um, uh, something like 55 million indigenous people were killed uh, either through uh, direct uh, um, uh, military actions or, or uh, particularly through uh, European diseases uh, that they hadn't, and, uh, they hadn't encountered before, new pathogens. Um, and so something like 55 million people died uh, or were killed in, in the Americas. And as a result, there were um, thousands of um, communities in small towns, what you might call them, uh, that disappeared. And the rate of reforestation as the forests, like in, particularly in, in uh, uh, Central and Latin America, overtook those places, that is uh, legible from outer space and would be present in the geological record. So the original um, argument for the Anthropocene was uh, that it began with the Industrial Revolution, um, particularly with the invention of the steam engine and power and um, the, the uh, factory system. Uh, and clearly that is an important event for um, CO2 levels in particular in, in the atmosphere and in the ocean. Uh, and so when, when the paradigm was being launched, uh, they argued there was sort of two phases, the beginning of the Anthropocene in the late 18th century, and then a sudden acceleration, a spiking uh, in the middle of the 20th century where you had um, atomic explosions, you had also uh, an explosion in uh, car ownership, in air travel, in air conditioning, um, the great, uh, uh, great increases in, in megacities, um, and so, uh, and also with nitrogen in, in the 20th century, um, being, being developed and used in uh, 
industrial agriculture. That was another huge impact. So um, all, of the, all of these events um, uh, and technological developments uh, accelerated the rate of planetary change very radically. So this links back to something I talked about in the previous lecture, which is speculative nonfiction, which we could also call anticipatory documentary. Okay? Um, and I suggested that the Nexus course as a whole is an exercise in speculative nonfiction, uh, that we're asking you to imagine yourself inhabiting 2050. Okay? It's a whole other kettle of fish to ask you to imagine yourself 2.5 billion years from now reading the isotopes in the geological record. Okay? I mean, that's, that's sort of an impossible leap of the imagination. But that's one of the things that the Anthropocene does is to get us to, to, to encourage us to think about uh, the legacies that we're leaving. Um, uh, and so it's not just about sleuthing for traces of our presence in the fossil record, but also raises certain ethical questions about um, what, what are our responsibilities for that legacy that we're leaving? What kind of ancestors do we wish to become? So this is uh, uh, Greta Thunberg. Um, in 2078, I will celebrate my birthday. If I have children, maybe they will spend that day with me. Maybe they will ask me about you. Maybe they will ask me why you didn't do anything while there was still time to act. Okay. So she's taking her life further out to 2078, and we're taking it way further out with the Anthropocene, uh, uh, looking at centuries, millennia, uh, even billions of years ahead. Um, so I suggested last time that scientific discourse is suffused with imagery, with metaphors. Um, and so one of the ways that um, uh, academics and, and artists have talked about the Anthropocene is looking for the human signature in the geological record. Okay, So you can see the metaphor of the signature and how do we read that signature. Um, it's about the carbon footprint. It's also more broadly about the ecological footprint that, that we're leaving behind. And another metaphor, um, in terms of, uh, of, of, of planetary change, uh, there have been these very heated and controversial debates uh, over geoengineering, where some geoengineers argue, uh, rather riskily in my mind, argue that we need to reset the global thermostat okay, by sending sulfur into the air or whatever it is. Okay? Um, so these, these, these planetary metaphors um, uh, permeate the Anthropocene debates. You know, the geological debate will play out. I, I think that's uh, a sideshow. I mean, really, what... The, I think the power of this is the metaphor. That's the power of this concept. I'm not sure how many Scrabble players have put an Anthropocene on their board yet, but there's a geological uh, evidence of this creature, Homo sapiens, coming through this growth spurt in this last couple of hundred years and leaving a signature, for better or worse, on the planet, on a synthetic planet. Okay, so I want you to use your clickers and at, a, at, a, at an emotional level, at, or at a tonal level, what word best captures the mood of the Anthropocene? Uh, comedic, ironic, paradoxical, or tragic? Oh, right. Okay, yeah.
Okay, so a strong uh, drift towards, strong consensus towards four. Um, that, that is not always the case, okay? There has been a lot of debate about it. I think um, probably the, the constituency we have here uh, is, is concerned about the scale and, and legacy of those impacts. But uh, perhaps just reconnecting with your groups, your many groups, um, I'd like you to discuss the advantages and limitations of this paradigm for thinking through uh, our relationship to the Earth. What, what, instinctively, what, how do you feel about it? Is, it? is it useful? Are there problems with it? Um, yeah. So just, just discuss that for a couple of minutes uh, among yourselves, and then we, we'll come back to that. Okay, let's uh, pool our ideas. Um, anybody want to start off? Yeah. Yeah, good. So it, 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 it's a way of aggregating our impacts, so I'm trying to see that whole. Um, and then thinking about the legacy, so uh, you know, it, it does raise political, ethical questions, um, existential questions. Yeah, good. Um, other thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good word. The weight, the weight of is 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 very unevenly distributed, in the present and historically. Um, so that, for instance, the average Nigerian, their CO two emissions is equivalent to uh, a return flight from New York to LA, one flight. Okay, and Nigeria is not by any means the poorest country in the world, but it's in per capita in the poorest third. Okay. So, so the, the question of how do we try to see humanity as a whole in evolutionary terms, but also then disaggregate that because the Anthropocene as a paradigm has emerged a, during an era of widening inequalities in most societies, not all societies, but the great majority of societies since like the eight, 1980s have become less equal, okay? And in less equal societies, you're going to have a less equal impacts as well, okay? Uh, 
so one more response. Uh, anybody, anybody else want to jump in on this? Anything we haven't touched on? Um, okay. Oh, there. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Yes, exactly. Okay. So it raises huge questions about agency and responsibility. Um, the Anthropocene is a story of agency, of uh, expanded agency. Um, and with agency comes responsibility. And some people are better positioned to exercise that responsibility on a large scale than others are. Yeah. So Will Steffen, who's a historian, uh, Australian historian has put it this way, it's difficult to overestimate the scale and speed of change. In a single lifetime, humanity has become a planetary scale geological force. Stuart Brand, uh, who, who, who founded, uh, um, was behi behind the whole Earth movement, uh, said, we are as gods and we must get good at it. So this was one end of the spectrum of the response to the Anthropocene, in other words, we're a super smart species, look at all the impacts we've had. What we need to do is amp up our uh, impacts and make them positive, okay? So some people might, would read this as, okay, humans have been, or humanity, or sections of humanity have been very hubristic. Um, why do you want to just uh, double down on the hubris, okay? Um, so the opposite, perspective of that is the um, science writer uh, Elizabeth Colbert who writes in New Yorker saying two words that probably should not be used in sequence, good and Anthropocene. Um, so that's more in line with how you voted on the clicker question that uh, advocates like Stuart Brand who, who talk about the good Anthropocene um, uh, are uh, in, in Colbert's view uh, misguided. So I won't go into this, but uh, as you can see on the right-hand side of the image, post-1945, 1950, you have a spike in, in all of these, uh, these impacts, the growth of cities, the growth of tourism, automobile uh, emissions, uh, airline flights, and so forth. So um, over time, and COVID has, has uh, heightened this, that the... Uh, there's been a very, very great shift in inequality in America and in many other societies. Okay. Um, and uh, you, you can look at these slides in, in, in your own, own time, but the uh, distribution of wealth um, and relatedly the distribution of impacts has shifted quite radically. Okay. This is, uh, it's, it's true of India, it's true of South Africa, it's true of Brazil. Uh, and many, many other countries. Okay. Um, so, so to my mind, when we think about the Anthropocene, what we need to think about is uh, what's sometimes called the Great Divide or the Great Divergence, okay? The inequality crisis in relation to the environmental crisis that is encapsulated in the Anthropocene. Uh, so one way of thinking about the Anthropocene is to see it as a, a way of aggregating data from many, many different disciplines and, uh, and, and having a conversation about the history of human impacts, the politics of human impacts, and the ethics of human impacts. Uh, and to do so against the backdrop of recognizing the great divergence, this, this growing gap in access to resources and uh, impacts on Earth's biogeochemistry. And so um, this is perhaps most evident in, in Earth's great megacities like Manila, this is Nicosia, uh, Rio, Delhi, 
and, and Lagos, which I'll get to in a minute. So you have uh, in the shadow of great wealth these uh, shanty towns uh, in informal settlements uh, arising that give a graphic sense of um, how differential uh, human impacts are and that we need to counter the Anthropocene as a species narrative with a more um, political account of um, different communities uh, impacts on earth uh, in, in, an, in an age of rising disparity. So I just want to give it a brief focus on uh, one of Earth's great megacities, namely Lagos in Nigeria, a city of about 21 million. Uh, and Lagos is situated on what's called the Lagos Lagoon. And there are two different environmental things going on here uh, that, that I wanted to talk about in conjunction. One is a project called Eco-Atlantic, uh, and this was uh, projected as a, uh, a green city, a gr uh, or a green micro city, if you like, uh, where access would be gained through helicopters. Uh, they had um, uh, Danish engineers build a, a seawall around it that is supposedly to last uh, 500 years. Um, and so it became a very kind of elite vision of um, greening at least a part of the city uh, and making it a world-class um, uh, engineering uh, spectacle, if you like. Um, but across on the other side of the, the same lagoon, you have Makoko, which is a, an aquatic slum or, or shanty town, made up primarily, as many shanty towns are, of uh, immigrants in, uh, from Benin, which is a, a poor neighboring country uh, next to Nigeria. Uh, and so there's some other environmentalists who are, are putting solar panels on the, on the, on the floating um, uh, houses, if you can call them houses, um, and using those to create schools for the poor and um, uh, water purifying facilities and things like that. So those are two very different green ideas that inhabit literally the same lagoon. Okay? Uh, and so what I'm suggesting is that in, in, in approaching the paradigm of the Anthropocene, uh, we need both to take an evolutionary perspective and then to disaggregate that perspective uh, in terms of the politics of the distribution of resources. Uh, and so I suggested that the Anthropocene is entails a form of reading. It's a reading practice, just like reading tree rings and ice core samples is a reading practice. And what we're interested in is the surface layer that we're, we're putting down here. You see the smokestacks there on the top left. Um, and I would suggest that we, we read that stratification of Earth history alongside another kind of stratification, which is the stratification of wealth and access to resources and the stratification of consumption habits, amongst other things. Um, uh, so mind the gap. Uh, and uh, I wanted to end with this, uh, I think, quite powerful image by the Spanish street artist, Sam Three, called Deep Rooted. And is an image here of surface deforestation, a surface act that ripples down into deep time. Uh, and so I think one of the ways this is a powerful Anthropocene image uh, is that it allows us to embody time. So he, he uses the human torso uh, and the, the arterial flows of impact down through time, the, the subterranean, if you like, uh, impacts. Um, and also, I think what's quite powerful about this is the refusal to separate human and non-human life, that we are implicated in the lives of uh, more than human species. Uh, and so, in this case, the toppling of the tree uh, becomes a kind of self-decapitation on the part of humanity, um, and the ripple effects are felt through 
the biochemistry, uh, biogeochemistry of, of deep time. Okay. Well, I think the, uh, one of the important takeaways from the Anthropocene as a paradigm is that there's a, a very big difference um, between impact and control. So when Stuart Brand says we are as gods and we, we, we must get good at it, um, that implies a certain idea of dominion. And for those of you who are uh, historians of science, perhaps, you know that going back to the 18th century, um, there was a dream uh, in, 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 within the uh, Enlightenment tradition of dominion and a hierarchy in which humans are at the top and some humans, especially white middle class uh, propertyed men, uh, were more human than other humans. And you also had a hierarchy with humans at the top and, and uh, non-human life below. Okay, So that has view of life on Earth has tended to segregate humans from other um, life forms and also to have confused dominion with control. Uh, dominion with, um, yes, dominion with control. So uh, as COVID-19 reminds us, there are many, many other agents that have huge power uh, over the conditions of life on Earth. Uh, we're not the only ones. So how do we better integrate ideas of human agency uh, and the agency of other life forms and life processes on Earth. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you.